Y'all sing loud. sent off and that's where we're going to pick it up this morning in verse 15 it says so those who can who conducted Paul 
brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So from Thessalonica, Paul headed to Athens. Athens, Greece, of course. And, and this was a place that was the cultural center of the world. If you remember in some of your studies back in school in Greece and the Greek gods and all the idols that they had here, this place was filled it was a cultural center, but it was also filled with idolatry. I mean, it was just covered up with, you remember all the Greek gods and mythology and stuff that you remember probably talking about in school? Well, this was the center of that type of activity that was going on here. So Paul headed to Athens, and when he got to Athens, he called back to Timothy and Silas, who'd been doing some discipleship work there, and said, come and join me in Athens as soon as you can. In verse 16 it says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was given over to idols. This place was covered up with idols. And again, you can remember uh, all the gods that the, the Greeks had, and this, this, this place was just covered up with it. All kinds of sinful activity taking place, and the city was just covered with idols. And the Holy Spirit convicted Paul, said, you need to bring the gospel message here. They need God. They need to hear the gospel message from you. And he was convicted after all the sinful things he'd seen in this city. Verse 17, Therefore he reasoned in a synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So we've learned by now we should have this pretty well um, in our heads, and where did Paul always start out at? He always, if they had one, went to the synagogue, started with the Jews and the, the uh, Gentiles who were trying to convert to uh, Judaism, and he would start with them and reason with them. It says he reasoned with them. What does that mean? He reasoned with them. He talked to them from the scriptures and pointed out from the Old Testament scriptures where it predicted the coming of the Messiah. And so he would show them from their own Old Testament scriptures, the coming of the Messiah. And he'll say, guess what? That Messiah has come in the name of Jesus. And he would reason with them and show them from the scriptures what he knew to be true. And he'd also, not only in the synagogue, it said he would go to the marketplaces where there was lots of activity going on, everybody coming to the market every day. And he would reason with them there as well and bring the gospel there as well. Verse 18, then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. All right, so what's an Epicurean and a Stoic? An Epicurean, these were philosophers who gave much thinking to different um, gods and different things of, in, the, in the cultural lifestyle that they lived at. Uh, a lot of them, that's all they did, would sit around and discuss these things. That's what they did for a living. So in Epicurean, they believed that you gave your all to overcome the flesh. For an example, for them to overcome, like, drinking, they would put all they had into drinking and try to overcome their problems by overcoming the flesh, by giving it all to that particular problem. It's kind of a weird way to deal with it, but that's what they believed in doing. And the Stoics, they were just the opposite. They believed in restraint and self-control, that they kept themselves from those types of things and tried to stay pure that way. And so what did they do, it says? And some said, as uh, these two groups came together, they're kind of in opposition to one another, but for Paul, they kind of, as a lot of the places did, they would come together to battle against Paul. And they said, what does this babbler want to say? In other words, what is this guy talking about? He's brought in this new talk about this Jesus. What is he babbling about? And others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. So when he came into Athens, this was new talk. They had all kinds of gods around there that they prayed to, that they worshipped. But when he brought in the message of Jesus, this was a new God to them. And they thought he was just babbling. They didn't understand what he was talking about as he preached Jesus. And notice all the apostles and disciples would always include the resurrection because Jesus had to die, be buried, and resurrect from the dead. That's the complete 
story of our faith. So the resurrection was always included because if Jesus isn't alive today, then our faith is dead because that's what we proclaim. And that's what he said he would do. <coughs> Verse 19. And they took him and brought him to Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. Now, Areopagus was this rock formation, a peculiar rock formation that sat up on this hill. And the Par Parthenon and some other great big buildings were up there. So they gathered up Paul and they brought him up to this peculiar place, Areopagus, and they wanted him to speak more to them of what this was that he was talking about. Verse 20. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, therefore we want to know what th these things mean. In this culture, when a new thing was brought in, that was what they longed for. They wanted to hear about this new thing and talk about this new thing and see if it could possibly be true or if it was false. So they took Paul up here and he want, they wanted to hear more. Verse 21. For all the uh, Athen Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear something new. Again, it's just telling us that was what their culture was about, to hear about new gods, to talk about the gods that they did have and the gods that they worshipped and new things. So they were awaiting this new message from Paul. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that you in all things are very religious. Now notice how he starts his message off. He kind of builds them up a little bit. I see you guys are some very religious people. And a lot of this religious stuff that they had was very superstitious as well. So he was kind of building them up a little bit to start his message. You guys are very, very religious. I see that. Verse 23, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, so as he walked through Athens and the different areas, he's seen all these different gods, all these <coughs> temples, all these idols sitting around everywhere. He said, I notice all these things. You guys must be very, very religious. He said, but you know what? I even found one other thing. I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. So they had some altar somewhere in the midst of Areopagus there. That was an altar, and on it had that inscription, to the unknown God. And he says, therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. So Paul says, you know, I know this unknown God that you're talking about. All these other guys, you know, he was wanting to say, they're dead, they're not gods, they're idols, they're made with men's hands, they're, they're nothing. They aren't really gods, but this unknown God that I'm bringing to you, I know him, and I'm going to proclaim him to you this day. So do you think that probably grabbed their attention, perked their ears up a little bit? Oh, he knows this God, and he's going to tell us about him. And he starts in, in verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it. God the creator. So he starts out from the very beginning. God the creator who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Uh-oh. He built them up and started getting their attention, and now he tells them something. There is a God, and this God is the God creator, but you see all these things you guys have made around here, all these temples and all these idols set up and all these different things whose men hands have made? Those aren't God. Those aren't gods. And God does not dwell in places made with men's hands. Just like here. This is the place that we come and worship. And it, we call it the house of the Lord. But is God confined just to this church? Well, if that was the case, what about the church down the road? And the other church down the road? God does visit us here. But he is not confined in a box to one place. God is everywhere at all times. And that's the one thing great about God. He's everywhere, hears everything, sees everything. We, it's hard for us to understand that, but that's God. God the creator, God the knower of all, and he is not made to dwell in just one place. And that's what many what they thought. Our God is in this temple. No, our God's in this temple. No, our God's in that statue. No, that's not the one true God. The one true God is everywhere at all times. That he is the creator God. 
as he went out to say, <coughs> nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So what he's saying here is he's not worshipped by you making something, by making a building or making an idol. No, he doesn't need anything from us. God has always been and always will be, and he doesn't really need anything from us. But he desires worship from us. The one true God desires worship. He gives you life and breath and all things for one purpose, to follow after him. And that is our sole purpose in <coughs> life, is to seek out God, find him, follow him, and worship him. That is our purpose. And that's what he was telling these folks here. He doesn't need anything from us. We need him. We need God. Go after him. Find him and follow him. Verse 26. It's interesting. Let me go back to 25. When he says he gives to all life, he gives two lives to us. Not only does he give us this physical life, but he also provides us the spiritual life for eternity. We don't want to forget that. He provides physical life and he provides eternal life. We get to make the choice of where we spend that eternal life, either with Jesus in heaven or in hell. We have to make that decision. Verse 26, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, <clears throat> and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. And he's saying, God put people where he wanted them. You were born in the United States, that's where he wanted you. If you're born in Africa, that's where he wanted you. If you're living in Europe somewhere, that's where he wanted you. We're all one blood <coughs> from the blood of God made in the image of God. And he's placed you in determined places at pre-appointed times that he's known about from the very beginning. And you have the boundaries of your dwellings. You know, most of us are going to stay in the United States. Most of the folks when they're born in Europe stay in Europe. That's not always the case. But he knows we have our places where God has placed us. And then he says in verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord, your place where you're at, and what is your, your duty or your job in life that you should seek the Lord. Find God in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So remember, he's talking to this group about this unknown God, and he said, you should be seeking this Lord. You should find him in the hope that as you're seeking and, and you are here now groping around against all these false gods and reaching out to these temples and false gods, you need to find him because he's not far from you. Search for the known God. Don't go after these false gods. And it's the same for us. We have lots of false gods out there we can follow. Money, fame, fortune, alcohol, whatever it is, there's lots of gods reaching out wanting to draw you in. But there's only one true God, and we need to be reaching out and trying to seek him and find him and not be groping in the darkness because he can be known. Notice it says, he is not far from each one of us. He just wants you to call upon him. And have you done that in your life? Call upon God. He's waiting for each one of us to surrender our lives to him and receive him as Lord and Savior. <coughs> Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. That's life, folks. If you really want true life, if you really want the best life you could possibly live, where is it found? In him we live and move and have our being. Until one finds their place in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they're not having the best life they can live. They're not having what God designed us for, that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he said, one of the interesting things about verse 28 is he knew their culture because this quote that he made, or he's getting ready to make, is from one of their own poets in their society. And so he used that to reach out to them. As he said, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. What they said was true. Now, they probably uh, said that about some false god of theirs. But he's taking some of their own words and using it. For we are his, also his offspring. We are made in the image of God. Now, coming from Paul, that was true. 
because we are the offspring of God. He made us special. We're like no other creation he made, made in his image, have a soul, and can have a personal relationship with God. Have you made that decision? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Your life will not be fulfilled. If you've ever wondered why you've got to feel empty and undone, until you have that relationship with God, you will feel that way. He is the missing piece of the puzzle in our lives until we get that personal relationship with him. And then you are fulfilled. Therefore, in verse 29, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and men's devising. He's saying you came from God. You're not a some man-made creation, some idol over here, some temple over here. You were made from God. You're the offspring of God. Have you ever thought about that? You are the offspring of God, straight from the hand of God, fearfully and wonderfully made by our God, the Creator. Verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So he's saying, there's times in life where we're ignorant. We're looking everywhere else for the answers to life. We are ignorant people. But he says, all men everywhere now need to come to repentance because we have the revelation of the truth. And that truth is Jesus Christ. He came to save man from his sins. We know the truth. We do not have to be ignorant. We can come out of our ignorance and come to Jesus. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. That man is Jesus Christ. He's saying God is going to judge this world one day by the man whom he ordained. That man is Jesus Christ. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Again, there it is. Notice the resurrection. He's given us assurance that Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected. Remember, he appeared to over 500, appeared to the disciples. He appears in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. We know he's real. We know he has done what he has said he was going to do. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father. And one day soon, as it talks about here, Judge is coming back. This time it's not going to be about uh, receiving him at that point because the suffering servant has already came and given his life for us. The next time he comes back, it's in judgment. And it's going to be separating those who've received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and those who have rejected Jesus. Only two, two groups of folks. There's not going to be a middle group. You either accept him or you reject him. To choose not to choose, they say, is to choose. If you choose not to receive Jesus, it's the same thing as rejecting him. Verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So just like every other response, some may find it resurrected from the dead. Yeah, right. Nobody is resurrected from the dead. So some mocked them. Others said, we want to hear more about this. We want to hear more on this matter of what you speak. And so Paul walked off from them. He departed from them. But verse 34 says, However, some men joined him and believed. Among them Dionysus and Aeropagate, a woman named Demaris, and others with them. So like usual, some believed, some wanted to hear more, and some rejected and mocked. And that's still happening today. Some people think, the message of the gospel is foolishness. Some think they want to hear more about it and keep wanting to get a little more information. And then some put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we have that same decision today. You know what? We have a choice just like they did. We know, some of us know the unknown God. Just like Paul put it here. We have put our faith in Jesus Christ. Some of you are still thinking about it, wondering if that's really what you want to do with your life. And some of you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and don't know if you ever will. Just remember, just as Paul told us here, one day Jesus is coming back. And you're going to have to stand face to face with him. 
and be judged on whether you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That could be the greatest day ever, or it could be the worst day ever, but you get to make that choice. Remember, we've got folks that we need to reach with Jesus. How did Paul reach people for Jesus? He reasoned with them from where? From the scriptures, from the truth of God's word. That's what we need to be about too, sharing the good news of Jesus from the word <coughs> of God. Show them the real God. Let's put quit putting idols out there for them to try to put their life in and follow. Most of us probably aren't doing that, but there's plenty of idols out there calling out to people, wanting them to follow them. Let's show them the real God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And remember, the sole purpose of our lives is to seek God, to find God, and to follow God for the rest of our lives and into eternity forever and ever and ever. And that's your calling from God. Have you received his calling? Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. God, it's great to know you. It's great to know a God who has revealed himself to us. Lord, they only had the Old Testament, but we have the full scriptures now. There's no excuse for us not to have a relationship with you. You have all the answers to life. You've given us the great honor and privilege of being made in your image, and you call us to seek you and find you and follow you. Lord, I pray everyone here has done that. But Lord, more than likely, there are some here today who haven't called upon you as Lord and Savior. Lord, convict their hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit and bring them to you this day. And for those of us who have surrendered our lives to you, Lord, help us to be obedient to you, keeping our eyes focused on Jesus and conforming to your word and not the world. We love you, Lord, and thank you for the awesome privilege it is to come into your house and worship you this day. We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your many blessings. In your precious name we pray. Amen.